The media has lied to you forever and you don't have a tested system for defining the difference between truth and propaganda. If you are overwhelmed and tired by the incessant internal conflict and overwhelm over the mistrust in information and truth, then keep watching. I'm going to read something for you. We are in an era where sensationalism, commercialism, and political desires to manipulate people's views have superseded accuracy and journalistic integrity as the primary objective of most of those in the media, and that this is like a cancer that threatens our well-being. If you believe that fake and distorted media is a problem and you are interested in watching the media and propaganda for clues about whether and how this is transpiring, then this video and this discourse will elucidate and explain that. That was from Ray Dalio's book, Changing World Order, which much of this conversation was inspired by. The loss of truth in the public domain and mistrust for media is one of the many characteristics that define a declining country and economy. There are six stages to an internal cycle that define the rise, the top, and the decline of a country and its economy. Stage five out of six is when there are very bad financial conditions and internal conflict. We are in stage five now. Stage six is when there are revolutions and wars. The six stages of internal conflict have been observed through hundreds to thousands of years of history. This is not a guesstimation, but an analytical assessment of repeated cycles that have occurred. One of those characteristics, as I said earlier, is the loss of truth in the public domain. In stage five, those who are fighting typically work with those in the media to manipulate people's emotions to gain support and destroy the opposition. Now, why this is important, because there are still some people who believe the media is not out to get you, is not out to manipulate you, that there is journalistic integrity and there are people out here trying to do a good job of reporting the news. And while that may be true in a minority of cases, the evidence for this is large and it repeats itself through history, which makes it particularly valid. Because when we look back through history, we can detach some of our emotion from the current reality. And it gives us confirmation that way. The media is not any one person, but it's a vehicle, an idea for expression of information. And that too can be fractured and invalid and unreliable at certain times, depending on where an economy and country is sitting in their six stages of internal conflict. So I'm not making this for the people who already believe that the media is not to be trusted or should be have some skepticism towards what the media is portraying. I'm making this for the people who are on the fence or believe that what the media put out there is relatively accurate most of the time. And I'm going to provide some evidence through history and currently that contradict that belief. So you can send this video to those people who are on the fence or maybe don't believe the evidence that demonstrates this so far. You can send this to them and show them. We've observed now, particularly in the last five years to 10 years, the media has become like a social vigilante. People are commonly attacked, big and small, any color, any shade, any demographic, but it biases towards certain demographics. They're commonly attacked and essentially tried and found guilty in the media, in this social court, and they have their lives ruined without judge or jury. Let's go back through history to see how this is defined. A common move among 1930s populists of the left, communists, and the right, fascists, was to take control of the media and establish a ministers of propaganda to guide them. The media they produced was explicitly aimed at turning the population against the groups that the governments considered enemies of the state. All the way from the 1930s around World War I, this behavior was exhibited, of course, Wartime makes sense, doesn't it? But what precedes war is often the same behaviors with media propaganda. Let's keep going. Another example. The government of the democratic run United Kingdom created a ministry of information during World War I and World War II to spread government propaganda. Now at the time, they wouldn't have said this, would they? They wouldn't have said this was uh, government propaganda. At the time, it would have felt like just the media and you would have felt like a minority to express your mistrust for this so-called propaganda. It is only through the lens of hindsight to which we have accuracy 
and a clearer sight to elucidate the fact that, wait, that wasn't truth. That was propaganda. That was an intention to sway people's political minds for a cause, for a different cause, for the, uh, it's someone's agenda or a company or businesses or an organization's agenda. The leading newspaper of this Ministry of Information, and the publishers were elevated by the government if they did what the government wanted them to do to win the propaganda war. And this was the Viscount Northcliffe, who controlled just under half of daily newspapers circulating around the UK in World War I. And it was known for anti-German coverage and was made the director of propaganda in enemy countries by 1918. Well, what happened to the other side? Well, they were vilified and suffered if they didn't cooperate. So you had a government run and encouraged newspaper publisher. It's like a puppet, like Pinocchio. And the puppet was being controlled by the hands of the government. But a lot of people are invisible or they're, they see it as invisible. They don't see the hands controlling the puppet. I'm trying to show you the puppet. The puppet always exists. There's a puppet master. I'm trying to show you the puppet master is controlling the puppet. And until you gain greater clarity and knowledge, you remain ignorant to the puppet master controlling what you want them to see. So if you become aware of it, your ignorance can be put into a light. During times of great wealth gaps and populist thinking, stories that bring down elitists are popular and lucrative, especially those that bring down the left-leaning elites in the right-leaning media. And those that bring down the right-leaning elites in the left-leaning media. So it goes both ways. History shows us the significant increase in these activities are a problem that is typical of stage five. We are in stage five. And when combined with the ability to inflict other punishments, the media becomes a powerful weapon. It becomes a powerful puppet master. It is well recognized this is happening at the time of this writing or this video. This writing was from 2021, 2022. The perceived truth in media, both traditional and social, is lower than any other time in our lifetime. Have a guess from 2019, how many percentage of Americans you think have a great deal of trust in the media? Have a think. 13% of Americans surveyed had a great deal of trust in 2019 towards the media and 41% had a fair deal of trust. That compares with 72% who trusted the media in 1976. So the mistrust in the media has gone down significantly. It's not just a fringe media problem, it's a mainstream media problem and a problem for our whole society. That dramatically decreased trustworthiness has even plagued former icons of journalistic truth, such as the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, which are now being discredited left, right and center. Sensational stories have become commercially rewarding at times when the media business is in financial trouble. This is why you have to deal with a great deal of skepticism towards big media outlets, because they are suffering. They weren't as profitable as they used to be. And they understand the more clicks, views they can get, the more ad sets they get from YouTube, the more clicks they get on the clicks and views that they get on ads. They are like a starving puppet master and they are desperate for money and attention, particularly as bigger podcasts and media giants take over. The modern media giants are podcasts. The modern media giants are influencers and individual people or small groups of people. And they are now competing against these people. So if someone becomes more and more desperate, what lengths do you think they would go to to survive? Great lengths. Would they lie to you? Would they manipulate you? Of course, because they're desperate and desperate people, their morals and foundations of their morals are tested. And their virtues are tested. And this is when a virtuous man is separated from an unvirtuous man. And what do they do? They compromise on their morals for the acclaim of influence and power and money. If you have a society where people can't agree on the basic facts, how do you have a functioning democracy? And that is what we're observing now. That's Martin Barron, the executive editor of the Washington Post. This dynamic is impeding free speech because people are afraid to speak up because how they will be attacked in both traditional and social media by distortions that are meant to bring them down. 
even very capable, very powerful people are now too afraid of the media to speak up about important matters or run for public office. They're too afraid. Fucking cowards. Cowards too afraid. Too afraid of their ivory to speak and compromise their position in their ivory towers. Now, you might say, well, it's easy for you. It's easy for you. You don't have as much to lose as them. And I think about this. And I understand that it's dangerous to be a high-profile person, a vocal person who, who fights for truth and justice, especially if it offends people who are inclined to use the media uh, to fight. I'm trying to deploy some empathy for these people to understand that when you're in a high-profile position, you feel like you have a lot to lose. <sighs> But I just come back to what are you willing to die for? What sword are you willing to die on? Is your is your the fabric of your moral being really that weak that you can't construct a logical sequence of arguments and ideas in a long format discussion? <sighs> Live by the sword, die by the sword, right? Morals, virtues, and values are more important than the fear of backlash on social media. They're gonna cancel me. People are gonna say bad things about you on the internet. Now I understand this can go far. People can get death threats. People's family can get communicated and contacted. I understand it has social and personal consequences and ramifications. So you have to weigh up the trade-offs. But there's a way to have civil discourse that is not but not everybody has to speak at the level of intensity, aggression, and perspicaciousness <laughs> as Andrew Tate. Not everybody has to speak at that level of risk because he's putting himself really on the line, speaking about the things the way he's speaking about. He's live by the sword, die by the sword. No matter what you think about him, he's living by the sword, die by the sword. Joe Rogan is someone who's told this line actually quite well. He's better to keep his family safe keep his people around him safe, he has been able to speak and stand on one of the most biggest platforms and speak about very controversial, sensitive topics. Dr. Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro. You have people who have put in place measures to protect the people around them and provide for them while attempting to speak truth, elucidate truth, and communicate it in an unbiased, objective way. At least that is what their intent appears. There are people out there doing this and there are people out there doing this successfully. And so I hope that can give you courage to do your own version of it instead of staying quiet like a coward. Let me conclude with some practical strategies on what you can do to understand truth from propaganda to lies. What questions should you be asking the information and the person you're receiving the information from? Number one. Does the story consist of emotionally triggering, unsubstantiated accusations, or are the facts substantiated and the sources provided? When the facts are put aside to create an exciting story and the resources are undisclosed, don't believe the story. A source and evidence must be provided for a contention. And then that source should be cross-referenced against what other people are saying about that contention. Do other people purport this contention? Could this be a fringe idea that is very early and very accurate? Or more often than not, this fringe idea is inaccurate and unsubstantiated in any high levels of evidence. Always ask, where did you hear that? Where did you get that from? Who said that? Don't just believe what you were told because you were told something. It's another example of the metaphorical puppet master. Number two. Does the writer and speaker welcome or not welcome replies or arguments counter to their position that refute the, what they were asserting? And are they willing or not willing to publish them and speak about them with what they published? For example, I tried to argue just a moment ago for the opposite perspective of how I can understand high profile people not wanting to take a stance. I understand. I empathize with it. I just believe we should put our morals and mor values and morals above our own personal preference of having bad people say things about us on the internet and having our feelings hurt. There is a way 
to walk the line and speak about controversial subjects in a objective, unemotional way that considers both sides of the opinions, both sides of the perspectives in a long format way, just like I'm doing now. It can be done. I don't recommend doing it on like a tweet. That's where a lot of people go wrong. They try and communicate complex ideas in 180 characters or a short paragraph, and then you're canceled. Till fall. Number three. Are the accusations in the story consistent with what has been identified and proven in the legal system? If people or groups are accused in the media of doing bad things, but they haven't been accused or judged to have done those bad things in the legal system, which follows a process that tries to weigh the evidence to get what is true, at least ask yourself, why is that? And probably don't believe the story. I'm going to mention his name one more time. It's a very relevant case going on, and that is of Andrew Tate. I'd like you listening, if you have any emotional reaction to that person's name or persona, try and put that aside just for a moment to understand the point. Because emotion clouds judgment. And so let's put that aside for a second. Simply put, observe how in this case, he was in jail for about 93 days and they kept extending his jail time every 30 days, one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. Uh, what In what seemingly was grasping for straws that quite weak evidence and given the Romanian system, uh, the legal system, government system, appears to have a history of corruption to greater degrees than uh, some other Western countries, then some skepticism is definitely needed to be deployed towards the validity of their claims. Moreover, there's a simple paradigm that we all agree to in the Western world and most of the world, and that's innocent until proven guilty. So no matter what you think about an individual person, then it is for a criminal court to decide. And he and his brother have not been prosecuted. And this trial will likely go on for years until they try and find something to prosecute them with. To come back to the question, are the accusations in the story consistent with what has been identified and proven in the legal system? The accusations of rape and human trafficking have not been yet identified and proven in the legal system. There has not been primary, substantial, consistent evidence, or really much evidence, it seems at all, as of this video's creation, to purport and demonstrate this. Later evidence may show that, but it doesn't seem, even if you just strip away all the emotion that some people have towards this man or his brother, just think about it. You got all the money you want, you got access to all the women you want, you are influential, you have a very stable life, you have a family. What motive could there be in the last five, ten years since you reclaimed all your wealth? What possible motive? Could there be to suddenly start exhibiting this abhorrent behavior in a man that seems to care about morals and values in particular? At least that's what he says. But putting that aside, with the money, the access he has to women already, the opportunity he has, the freedom he has in his life, it doesn't make much sense to... If you're committing these crimes and these abhorrent acts to then put yourself on some of the most popular podcasts and become the most viral man in the last five years, it doesn't make much sense. If you don't want to slip, don't go where it's slippery. Jeffrey Epstein wasn't a public figure. He wasn't trying to put himself out there and, and speak about his life. Uh, Think about some of the more popular people who are actually prosecuted for, for crimes they've committed. They typically, typically on average, aren't putting themselves out there online because that's very risky and they want to stay quiet. So if a person had a history, a consistent history of criminality, why on earth would they want to put themselves in the limelight and be risk and put themselves in risk of being investigated by every second person. Doesn't seem very logical to me. I know there are exceptions to the rule and people make mistakes and they slip up and they do that, they, they commit a crime, they commit an act and they make a mistake. 
but this is a consistent set of behaviors they are trying to prove against him. Doesn't make first principles sense. I'm not saying it can't be true. I'm saying when we just strip it back, it doesn't really have a strong motive at all. And I encourage you to consider that for any case with any person where it seems a claim is being made, but evidence and prosecution has not been conducted yet. Just sit back, wait, reserve judgment until that is the case. Number four, and lastly, if the writer or outlet has previously been showing themselves to be biased, assume that they and their stories are biased. Now we can see this being very common in mainstream media outlets. They show their bias frequently, whether they're left-leaning, right-leaning, whatever it may be. Be very careful of people who consistently show a bias towards one agenda, one perspective, one idea, one ideology, because that will skew their perspective and they will look for opinions and evidence that confirms what they already believe. This is called confirmation bias. It's very common and once you become aware of it, you can begin to see it all over the place. It means where you look for evidence to confirm your existing and pre-existing belief. Let's say I'm a carnivore. Let's say I'm a carnivore advocate or a vegan advocate. Well, then I'm going to see and look for studies and research and people that confirm my already existing belief that the vegan diet is great for my health or the carnivore diet is great for my health. Instead, instead, imagine if you had a commitment to truth, no matter where it lay, even if it lay outside your preferred opinion and preferred perspective, even if it undermined part of your identity. Can you have the value system, wherewithal, discipline, and commitment to the truth above all else that you're willing to restructure your identity and values because you were proven wrong and what you thought was true is no longer true. The commitment to the truth above all else, even if it is compromising to your ideology and your identity, is the mission and the goal. And if more people had that commitment, then we'd be able to have a lot more civil discourse and a healthier, more stable society. If you want to see more videos like this, I invite you to subscribe and comment below to let me know. I'm Alexander Emmanuel Sandalis. Thank you for watching.